What happened? Someone live. Okay, we're live already. I'm just warning you. Oh, okay. okay. Let me just find my keys. Shom, do you know where my keys Okay, I'll do the intro. Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Francisca Show, a Jewish coffee house podcast, the show on which people share their stories. This is the Survivor Special, where survivors of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse come forward to share their experiences, thereby raising awareness and preventing the likelihood of it happening again. No further research has been done into these stories, and this episode is intended for mature audiences, and listener discretion is advised. I'm Francisca, and you are listening to the No More Silence on The Francisca Show. And welcome, Miriam, to the show. Hi, I'll be just another second. I'm sorry. I'm getting to a good space where I can speak. <laughs> We are setting this up. Okay, let me know when you're ready. I'm good now. Great. And do you have headphones you could stick in? Oh, I'd have to go back in. Do you okay. want me to? Um, okay, right now, there, there is some feedback. Let me just see if Facebook is getting the feedback. Sorry, everyone, we're just testing this out. Mm -hmm. Hello? Okay, I cannot even test this out, even if I wanted to. Okay, let's hope that this works. So just have in mind when I'm speaking. Okay. I wonder if anyone could comment here saying if they hear, if I sound funny. Or if there's feedback. Okay. I'm going to keep talking. Okay. So welcome to the show, Miriam. Thank you for offering to share your wonderful story with us. Well, not wonderful. You are a wonderful person and you're going to open up with us and that's really special. We already have an audience here. Okay, somebody said they could hear us and see us. So as we usually start this podcast, I'd like for you to just give us a little introduction and you can start wherever you feel like it's most relevant. And again, thank you so much for coming on to the Francisco Show for the No More Silence segment and sharing your personal and vulnerable experience with us. Okay, so my name is Miriam Yeager. As you already mentioned, I am a life coach. Um, and very interestingly, as a mental health professional, like I was, once I, once I became a mental health professional, I was really, I had this view that like somehow we were immune to any, I don't know, any sort of like, mental health issues, if you will, or any sort of like abusive experiences. Um, and my story really uh, shows that, that that's not the case, A, for mental health professionals and B, really for anyone, you know. Um, so uh, I'm not really sure where to start, but I guess I'll just talk and then you can ask me questions and we can kind of go from there. Um, so basically, um, I was experiencing like very, very extreme abuse um, and did not even like have any, I, I didn't even have a label to to it. Like I was just like, okay, these people in my life are just making me, at me, my husband, my family, just absolutely insane. Um, and just really, 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 I would say wreaking havoc in my life and my, um, my mental state, my emotional state, like really in such a, like, constantly like I became um I would say probably would I would probably say it started you know like when I became a mom and this person you know would just these people rather um would just constantly you know tell me that my parenting was off and 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 
constantly questioning everything that I did with my daughter, um, like to the point where like, you know, the socks that I put on were, were, were not good enough. And I mean, really, really extreme. And in every, every area of my life, like every thought that I had, everything that I said was questioned. And, and I felt like my entire life was put under like a microscope. Um, you know, and was just open for comment, open for ridicule, open for whatever, you know, they felt was okay to say and, and do, um, you know, the, I mean, and it really wasn't until like a few years later after I already had become a life coach and I was already just doing, you know, reading everything related to mental health, um, wanting to expand, um, you know, as a coach that I found this article on nar a narcissist. And when I read that article, it was the first time in four years, I think it was, that finally everything made sense. Um, and that really led me to study narcissistic abuse very, very deeply um, because I felt like, firstly, I needed to get out of the craziness that it really created it inside of me. Like what it, when, when you're abused in such an extreme way, like my husband would compare to like being mentally raped and I know that that sounds awful but when anyone who has experienced this form of abuse where they, they literally like um, just attack like your your values your thoughts your feelings like every single thing about you is questioned over and over and ridiculed that that that's really what it feels like um it, it, it Recently, I have seen other people in the mental health space talking about narcissistic abuse, and I'm really, I'm really happy to see that there's more awareness coming about. I have not um, seen a lot in the firm world, which is where I feel like it's it's so so important, it's so necessary. There, there, you know, the the stories that that I have that I know of friends of mine or just other people um, in the firm circles as well as the non firm circles and society as a whole were just. Uh, are just really, really, really um, pretty horrific um, of the abuse that people have been um, have have experienced. Um, and I, what I really learned, and what was very fascinating to me, was that when I really studied abuse in depth, like everyone thinks that it's like the the people that are just weak or the people that are just um, not strong and and just right? Like, I don't know, people have this image of like, who gets abused, I, or at least, uh, you know, I definitely had an image and definitely, you know, lots of people I know. Um, and what was very, very fascinating to me was that it's actually the the research that showed me as well as my own, like, uh, you know, the, the, all the women that I spoke with, what it really showed me was that it was the people that were the most empathetic, most caring, most loving, most giving, and the reason that they were able to be abused is not because they were weak or not a good person, but in fact, the opposite. It's they were so kind hearted and so caring that, they, but they didn't have boundaries. They were empathetic, but they didn't know how to, how to like not feel bad all the time for everyone. They didn't know how to say no when somebody, you know, tried to, um, and, and that, that was very, I think what's very, very interesting and about narcissistic abuse is that it really, it's the abuser, firstly, people that are narcissistic really don't even realize it. Um, and this was something that was also very interesting for me is that they are actually just in really, really deep pain and they have never healed from the trauma, from the intense experiences that they have had. Um, and it, for some, like they're they're not even aware of what they're doing, um, even though it's so so extreme. They become like obsessed with the other person and obsessed with wanting to have what they have. That they end up like abusing them in such an extreme way because they're so envious and want what the other person has so badly, um, which is really like peace and uh, you know being kind and loving and and uh, all the positive traits that they have in, you know within them. Um, I had another point. I was, I don't hear you. Okay. So tell us a little bit more about how the abuse started. I know you mentioned when you realized it was happening and all the research behind it, but could you tell us more step 
us back if you would like, if you can, into the shoes of what, what that abuse looks like. And I know you can do examples, but could you go a little deeper? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like being, it, you know, it's it's it always happens with someone that is in your circle. So whether it's family, whether it's friends, a coworker, a uh, a boss, you know, without me going into the specifics of who it was, um, because that is totally unnecessary and, and, and not the point of what I want to, you know, I don't, I don't feel there's a reason to out people um, in, in, in different circumstances. It just depends on what. So without going into that, um, how it happened, you know, just people came into my life um, and, you know, it was people in my life that were a very, you know, I, I guess I would say that it happened when we um, became, they became an integral part of our lives because of circumstances like all ordained from Hashem. Um, but it was, they were a very, very big part of our lives. Um, and I saw them quite a bit and there was no, so they, as far as the abuse itself, I mean, they had no boundaries at all. Like I was not allowed to have even physical space. Like I would like, she would like touch me. Like I'm just, was always the kind of person that hated being touched. Like, I just don't like hugs. I, you know, I'm just not like, it's just not, you know, and she would just touch me and be like, I know you don't like being touched, but I'm going to like touch you anyways. And it's like, that's not okay. You know, that, that, that's like, um, you know, having that being done consistently is just really not okay. And that's just like a really, really small example, but like anything that I would say, you know, anything that was important to me was questioned. Like, why do you think this? Why do you believe that? Oh, but I think differently and the whole world thinks differently and I know better than you. Um, so when it came to like my parenting, like I have my views on parenting and it's my child and it's my motherhood and to have that put into question like constantly over and over and over is just um extremely abusive I mean to the point where you know I doubted my own self like you know hearing that over and over and over again it, it can't it's not possible like no matter how strong you are unless you know unless you're able to implement the tools that you need to um, you know, you can't, you can't, like, it affects you, right? Like, it, it causes, um, it caused, it caused me to really lose touch with myself. Like, I felt like I just had to please this other person because, like, I guess, like, in my mind, I was like, okay, if this person, like, if I lived up to her expectations, then, like, at least she'd leave me alone. But that didn't happen either. Like, what basically ended up happening was, like, I just totally lost touch with who I was as a person and I totally became like I guess you would say really like a shell of myself um and it was just um uh, yeah it was <laughs> it was not good um also I think because this person or these people were in a place of some sort of authority to you or you look looked up to them I think that's why they had such a big effect on you so it was just some yeah. random person in your community or on the street, you wouldn't take notice of what they're saying, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, it's really, I, I like I always say, it's always like someone that ends up being a big integral part of your life. Like if somebody says something, any of these things like, you know, just if it happens here and there, it doesn't affect you. But when it's a constant, like if, you know, if you're living with someone or if somebody, you know, you see them constantly all the time and they're consistently doing this, like every word that comes out of your mouth, every time you do anything, every time you say anything, every single that, like, that's just, um, it's just, it's not, it's very, very abusive. For sure. So once you realized what was happening, how, what steps did you take to break away from them? And I see one of our listeners here uh, actually ask this, what what happened to stop this for you to take charge of your life? So one of the things that I, I would say the first thing that I really started to focus on was really, um, really focusing on my own self care, like, and in physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Um, and 
the reason I felt like this was so important was because I needed to bring myself back into the picture. Like it, I needed to stop having someone else's thoughts in my mind. I needed to start like actually being myself. Like, I mean, to the point, th this person was so abusive to the point where like, anytime I, I would take care of myself, she would like ridicule me and like make comments about like how terrible it is. And I'm, like, it, I, I don't even, I don't even know how to like put it into words to but it was like like jealous like and it's like when you're constantly you know so so that's the part I felt was really um really really missing um and you know and that was for sure the first step that I took um yeah did you limit your correspondence or your interaction with her I wasn't really able to I wasn't able to, unfortunately, because of my circumstances. It was, it was, um, like I said, it was all from Hashem. And I, and I, when I realized, like, I guess when I realized how, what it was, when I was able to actually label it and realize how abusive it was, um, I wasn't able to limit it yet at that point in my life, like just, um, like I said, circumstances from Hashem. Um, but what I did do was I learned how to also implement healthy boundaries. So I stopped. I mean, I did actually um, like it kind of happened. It was a very interesting process for me. Like it happened and I realized that, you know, I was kind of searching for my way as a life coach and trying to figure out what I was meant to do. And when I realized that was happening, I was like, okay, I need to heal, but I also need to help other women. Um, and so because I had all the tools as a mental health professional, I was able to kind of be like, okay, this is what I need to do for myself. Um, and I ended up actually uh, signing on a client at the same time um, to help her out of uh, an abusive, narcissistic abusive relationship. Um, in her case, it was a boyfriend. Um, and so what ended up happening was it was, it was, um, I ended up actually ha having like a very, very, um, I guess like things got really, really, really bad for me, but like my, it, it, my mental health, I would say. Um, and I ended up going to a therapist. I found like the best therapist in the area. Um, and she, she basically guided me. She was like, okay, listen, you know, you're a life coach and, and this is what you're meant to do you know, to help this woman that I had um, signed on as a client. And she's like, okay, I'm just going to give you the steps that you need to take um, in order to help yourself as well as this woman. Um, and so I guess like, I really kind of, it was very interesting because I did my own healing at the same time as I was helping somebody else, um, which made, it made it more powerful for me as well as for her. Um, and thankfully, um, I mean, since then now I've, I've moved states and this person is really a very, very small part of my life. These people, I would say, um, I mean, it, it got, um, I mean, it, yeah, uh, <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, there was, there was, yeah, there were more extreme parts to it. Um, but, but we moved states and, and it's it's really it's been a bracha like i always tell people to get as far away if they can while they're still in this situation there's a lot that could like you know the self-care mindfulness was also something that was the second step i would say that i really took to help myself because i really needed to take charge of my own mental state and to stop thinking about that person like what happens is when someone abuses you so much like all you hear is their thoughts like you don't hear your own thoughts anymore so i had to like um really take control of my own mind um and yeah and and, and implement healthy boundaries wow so <laughs> i i this is the first time we're doing this live and you have your face to the whole world <laughs> and it's it's not such a safe environment if i would have to i mean all my previous interviews were pre-recorded and some of them were not face to face they were just audio and well i appreciate you making yourself vulnerable i'm just wondering if there are things you're holding back because it's just an uncomfortable space to be in um, um. Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, <laughs> there's one piece that I'm holding back. Yeah, I, I feel like I've, many people know me um, in this space as helping people heal, heal from narcissistic abuse. And I guess I feel like, 
I, I've held back for a long time and actually t- sharing that this has been my experience, but I have had clients ask me directly and I kind of feel like I'm sharing my experience mostly because I feel like, uh, I feel like maybe this is going to be a way to help a few more people feel comfortable reaching out for help. And that's really my sole purpose in coming out, you know, uh, sharing this publicly, not because, you know, like, thank God I'm in a very healthy state right now. I've moved on and, but I know what it is. I, I can say that, you know, the research shows that, um, someone else, in my, I heard someone else who has made it big, um, now in this area say that literally what happens is, is that people go, it's so, so extremely abuse that they break every boundary physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and sexually, that it becomes so severe that people either become suicidal or they end up, or the narcissist, if it's like a relationship, a spousal relationship tries to kill them. So I, which is it's it sounds so severe but it's true it's true this is literally the experience of everyone i've spoken to so you know it did get very very bad for me uh, before i reached out for help you know i thought you know i'm so strong i can handle everything on my own but i i absolutely couldn't and you know like i said that's when i did go to the therapist i said to her you know you've got to help me out. Like what, how do I, what do I do? You know, I've implemented so much, but I don't, you know, and that's when, um, you know, as far as I, I guess like the pieces that I've, I guess you're asking about what I've held back, I guess, you know, I did have suicidal thoughts. I, um, I know that there are other mental health professionals who have had that as well. And I, and I, I guess I'm saying this because I feel like if there are other mental health professionals, it's, it's super important um, for them to know that this happens. You know, I, I remember going into the therapist's office and, and I said to her, I was like, I don't understand. Like, I'm such a strong person. Why am I having these thoughts? And she's like, you know, and her response was like, so what? Like, this happens to everyone. <laughs> like, you know, just because like that doesn't make. So I, I guess I'm, you know, this is kind of like because I've seen stories of mental health professionals who have actually committed suicide, who have been driven to that. So I guess, I guess, you know, it's important for there to be more awareness for people to understand that even very strong women, you know, can, can ex- be pushed to such extremes. Um, the other, I guess, piece that I've held back is that um, there was also a man in my life that was also had the same tendencies. Um, and I guess, um, yeah, like the, he didn't push as many buttons in the same way, but he did make sexually a seductive comment to me. And this was a firm person. And, you know, as a firm woman, I really did not know how to deal with that. It was, you know, I mean, it's not, it's unfortunately not the first and only time that I experienced that as a firm woman from, from people. Um, and it's highly inappropriate, really not okay. Um, for me, what I just, what I've learned is to just create really, really strong boundaries. You know, I think I, it's very interesting because I feel like as firm women, we grow up and we're very segregated, but then we become professionals. And then in the professional world, it's very like blended. Like I worked with men for, you know, I was in business for 10 years. I worked with many men. Um, and it was, it was, it's very interesting. Like, it's a very interesting thing that happens where like your, 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 your colleagues, you're not necessarily, you don't necessarily have the intention for anything more than that. But, you know, sometimes men don't, don't have strong enough boundaries or, or you just don't realize, right? Like you unintentionally create this space where they just feel like comfortable with you and feel like it's okay and again it's especially for people who are empathetic like you know they come to you with their problems and you're just like okay let let me hear let me help you through it but then it's more for them like you're just trying to be kind and helpful and nice but you know so um you know moving like I said moving states was the biggest bracha for me and um is that why you moved it's one of the reasons. Um, wow. <laughs> it's one of the reasons. Yeah. 
Yeah. And would you say, so I'd like to talk more about the thought, what the process looks like to start getting rid of the voice in your head of your abuser. Like you mentioned the thoughts. Like how does yeah. someone transform themselves from being, hearing someone else's voice in their head and viewing everything they're doing through the opinion and approval process of the yeah. user to having, to restoring your own voice. So, so when I said, okay, so I said total self-care and that's kind of like a very broad term, but it really um, has a lot of things in it. Um, firstly, I visit, I took care, I started to take care of myself physically. Like I started to eat super healthy. I started running every day. Um, there's something very, very grounding about physical exercise and specifically high intensity for anyone who's able to do it. Like it just, it, it's, it's a really, really good way to kind of like help you process emotions and help you really feel physically present in this school, like in your body and in the world. And, um, the second part to that is really, you know, my, my mental state, which was really what I implemented was mindfulness, which is really the idea of being present in the moment without allowing thoughts from the past or the future to take over. Um, and so what I did was the way that I found very helpful was to get in touch with my five sense senses. Anytime like I found my thoughts thinking about what the other person would think or anything like that or worrying or I felt like anxiety or anything, I was like, okay, what can I see? What can I hear? What can I taste? What can I smell? What can I touch? And it really brought me back to like right then, right there. So like if I was cooking, right, you know, I'd look at the pan and be like, okay, right now I'm cooking. I'm going to make this a nice time. Like forget about that person. Right. Um, and that's, and I really, really did that with everything in my life. Like I kind of did like a, I put myself through like my own, I guess, mental health boot camp, if you will. And, and was kind of like, okay, I'm just going to, every single, like on my social media, I'm only going to see positive things. I'm going to like, um, and, and I kind of really just applied it all around um you know emotionally um it was very important for me to feel my feelings like to accept that like this was the most painful and most of the worst experience i ever went through in my life and to allow myself to like process that and be like okay this was not okay at all this was highly abusive this you know and really be able to i guess like let go of like all those um yeah, like it just, it felt so, like I was so angry. Like, how did somebody do this to me? You know, how could somebody do this to me? So I guess really just um, allowing myself space to feel all of that so that I could actually let the experience go. And spiritually, like that was, I think, the part that got affected most, like initially, like I felt like that's where they... And I, and I feel like that's where narcissists get you initially. They start to question your belief systems, your values. Um, and I was like, no, you know, I started to, to, to be very conscious to, to ask myself, like, what are my values? What are my values in parenting? What are my values as a person, as a woman? What are my values as a wife? Like, and I really started to um, ask myself rather than allow myself to continue on the path like I I I became like very spiritually disconnected like it was very very weird because I mean like I it was like to the point where like I met someone and she said to me she's like oh you're a really spiritual person and I, I remember thinking like how huh? like how would she say that about me? my own husband wouldn't have said that about me at that time because that's how like just disconnected I was from myself like and I was so it really I really made a very, very conscious effort, like every day and every moment to try to regain myself and, and, and find like myself again. Yeah, I really love how you describe it. And it seems like your mental health professional profession has assisted you in just being more aware, knowing the techniques. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'd like to ask you, I think this is unique to your story. We haven't had this much on the podcast before, I don't think at all. Your, this experience, your abuse happened throughout your marriage while you were, while you are in this relationship, in, in a place potentially where someone's supposed to have your back and you should be protected. And I know a child in a home sort of 
their parents are supposed to be those protectors and safety net for them. Um, yeah. So how would you say that affected your family life and your relationship? Because that happened, that was happening while you were married. That was like something really you brought into your marriage. That, that was the worst part about it. That was literally what, I, you know, I mentioned earlier that I started having suicidal thoughts. That was why. Because it, it destroyed my relationship with, I mean, they were still close to me and they still loved me, but I wasn't showing up as the mother I wanted to be. Like I was, it was constant. Like anytime, anything I did with them, it was like, you know, I, I, I had found a philosophy, a parenting philosophy that was new age, but I really believe is very, very, um, as a mental health professional, like I really believe very strongly in like respecting my children and seeing them as people. And that was challenged every day, all the time. And so when I would parent them, I would just, I would doubt myself. Like I remember when my, my daughter turned four years old, I remember like it being her birthday or something. I just remember very clearly, like, I was like, Oh my God, like for four years, I've been doubting if I'm a good mother, like this is crazy. And not for my own thoughts. Like when I was alone, I knew that I was a great mother, you know, and, but it was just from, from all this, you know, input from somebody else. And I was like, this isn't, you know, this isn't normal. Like I, I, I have to take charge of myself and, and tell myself that I am a good mother. Um, and it definitely, definitely affected my family. Um, things were not as, as peaceful or as joyful or as loving or as, uh, you know, as I wanted them to be. And, you know, that's what really drove me to, to the point where I was just like, I can't take this anymore. This isn't like, I'm like, I, I can't go on like this. I can't go on parenting, you know, feeling totally at odds, going from one feeling like I'm going from one extreme to the other, because I just, I just don't know. I don't know who I am anymore. I don't know how to, what's right anymore. What's okay. What's, you know, like, I, I hope I'm making sense. I yeah. feel like. But did your husband witness this and like what what was the dynamic like? We were kind of both entrenched in it. It was kind of like our family all together experienced this. I know, like even my children experienced it and, and that was uh, the most painful thing to see. Like just, you know, feeling like for me it felt like my children were being taken away from me. Um, you know, and, and just, it was, yeah, it just, it was not, it was not healthy. So as a parent and real finding your voice after what are some of the things you've implemented or used to teach or communicate with your children about the past experience they were involved with as involved with as well? So really, I really feel like, you know, we moved, uh, I think it's seven months now, maybe eight months. One of the really big things we focused on was really making sure that they felt safe, knowing that like, you know, I, I we even told them, like I had a conversation with my kids, like they're, they're young. My daughter's now seven, she was six and four and two. And I said to them, I was like, listen guys, we're moving this, that was our old life here on in we're we're acting differently to each other we're gonna you know and it really they saw they really saw it's it's amazing how how much children can see and pick up and and you know like in my it, it was it was really incredible seeing their the the expression on their faces like when they saw that like we were just it was gonna be different you know and and thankfully it, it really really it's it's been it's been like, we're so much closer to each other. We're so, we're all so much happier. Like we just, our family is able to be our own family without any negative input from anybody else. Yeah. So, so th since this is so recent and you've been helping other people get out of situations like this and heal from abuse like this, um, does that mean that this can be a fast transition or where are you on the healing spectrum? That's my question. How, how do you help your clients? 
Yeah. So I am really at the point where I'm completely past it. Um, I've actually taken on a new, you know, gone into a new space professionally. I still help people with narcissistic abuse um, because I feel so strongly that this is so important. And I, I feel like it's a like literally like a mitzvah for me to help people because I know that like professionally I spoke with so many other professionals, therapists, coaches, and nobody is willing to even like touch this form of abuse because it's so um, it's so extreme that the response I always get is like, what are you, are you I, like, are you crazy? Like you're going to try and help people in that way. And, and you know, and so I, I feel like Hashem made me go through this experience in order for me to help other people. Um, the program that I created is actually only an eight week program. Um, and my very first client that I created it for, it ended up being extended to like three, three months at the time um, because we were doing it over Tishrei and young to got in the way. But by the end of the time that she worked with me, she actually left the relationship um, with her, you know, with her boyfriend. And, and she, it was, she had been working with um, a therapist for two years prior and she wasn't able to make any headway. Um, and I, I share this because so, so many people are really in the mental health field are so confused by this. Um, and I feel like, I, I just feel like, you know, each one of us goes through different experiences in our life and they're for us to grow. And I feel like Hashem made me experience this so that I understand how to help people and I can help people um, get out of it. As far as how quickly it does depend on the person and the situation. But people, firstly, that have left the narcissist can absolutely heal in eight weeks. People that are still in a relationship, it really depends. Like if it's a marriage and there's children and they don't want to leave, there's still ways that they can heal enough so that they can create healthy boundaries within the marriage so that they aren't like there, there's so much, so much healing that anyone can do regardless of the situation um, that they're in. But if, but I always say, if you can, if it's a friendship or a boss or, you know, anyone that is not like immediate family that you can leave, I always say leave. And what, why are mental health professionals so confused by this topic? Is it because it's such a gray area and... It's a good question. I think because it's such a such an extreme form of abuse, like it's so, like I've studied. I've actually studied uh, lots of different forms of abuse. I've studied uh, sexual abuse in depth as well, um, and you know, I always read that sexual abuse was the worst form of abuse, which it absolutely is. But I would say that narcissistic abuse is even worse, and it it encompasses sex, sexual abuse very often. Um, with all the women that I've spoken to. Um, it, it's, it's, it, it really encompasses all forms like physical, you know, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, sexual, everything, financial. Sometimes they, they, women are so, are, are literally put into this space where they're forced to ask people for money. Like I, the stories that I've heard from people that I know. And, and I guess that's why I'm so, that's really why I'm coming on to do this because I, I've had friends of mine tell me. You know, that I had a friend who is very, you know, means so much to me. Tell me that her husband forced her to ask a friend for money, left her in the car with no gas and no money to pay for gas, like picking her kid up from school. I mean, it's so, so extreme, which is why I think so many, um, so many mental health professionals are really scared off. The other thing that happens is also, um, it, it, which I've seen with many of the women that I spoke to is many of them, unfortunately, it's so sad. They get so, they become so mentally unhealthy that they feel like there is no way out. And they literally just, they, they get so stuck in this hole and they're just not even willing. Like they, they just, they think it's not possible to get out, you know? And so they, they, they just don't, I don't know. They're just, they're, they're not, um, like if you extend an ha a hand to help them, they just, they don't even take it, which is again, one of the reasons why I feel like there needs to be so much more awareness because I feel like the more awareness we put out there, the more that people know that like this happens to other people 
and other people get out of it. Like my first client, um, I'm so grateful that like Hashem put her in my path because not only did she get out, but she's actually, she became firmer from it. She, from the experience she she had been looking to become from her and she started to learn more and she but not only that she she's now married happily married to a very healthy man like she could have god forbid been stuck in this relationship with this man who was so abusive for the rest of her life whereas now she's so happy like you know and that's and 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 i share because i feel like people need to know that not only can they get out of it but they can find true happiness i i actually had this um very fascinating conversation with um another coach who went through a very emotionally abusive marriage and she um we had this conversation and she hadn't intended to share with me but she started like it just kind of came out and she was like i'm telling you when you go through something so extreme the light that comes out on the other side is just way beyond anything you could have imagined and when she shared that with me, she's like, I don't even know where that came from. That was literally God speaking through me. And that's really, I feel so strongly that that's literally the way Hashem makes it. Like when people go through such an extreme, extreme um, form of abuse or extreme traumatic experience, that's why. And, it, you know, it's like um, they really do come through on the other side with a much deeper light, a much deeper um you know, much more to share with the world. So I, I want I want people to know that. I want them to know that like doing the inner work, yes, it's difficult and painful and, and you're facing it, but you can come out on the other side being stronger and wiser and more confident and loving yourself like more than you ever have. And, and just, you know, having a voice and using it and making a difference in the world. Yeah, and I... I think we'll end with this. I'm just so curious. What does the realization look like when you are like, this is what's happening to me. I'm being abused right now. What what does that look like? And if there are like five things that you could just st say that anyone listening can really get in tune with what's happening in their life or maybe if they see it happening to somebody else. Um, so what it looks like, honestly, is a complete breakdown. <laughs> like, like this is so extreme. I cannot handle this. Um, you know, I, I, for the first few days, I, I was just like, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not proud to say this, but this is what happened. You know, I was literally just shouting at my husband. I was like, this is crazy. We can't do like, this is not normal. Why are we allowing this? Like, this is just so, so extreme. We have to get out of it and you have to help me. Like we need to do this together. Um, and so it was definitely like a few days of us just like, and he, and he was, thank God, very supportive and was like, you know, just get it all out. Tell me everything you need to say. Um, but yeah, it was, it was not pretty. Wow. And you wanted to share something with our listeners about some of the services you offer. Yeah. Yeah. So the program that I created uh, for my first client is a program that I've shared with many women. I've thankfully been able to help many women um, overcome and heal from narcissistic abuse. Um, it can be found on my website, Miriam Yeager. So that's M-I-R-I-A-M-Y-A-G-E-R. -E People always uh, confuse my, how to spell my last name. So uh, MiriamYeager.com. And if you click on the narcissistic abuse tab, um, my program is there. I also have a free webinar there. So if you're listening and you're not sure if what you're experiencing is narcissistic abuse or you're just looking for more information, I have a free webinar on there as well that really goes into detail um, and goes through all the steps that you need to take in order to heal from it. Wow. Thank you so much, Miriam, for sharing your story and for coming onto the show and really putting yourself out there. I know this is your first time doing this and it's such a public way. Okay. I'll let you speak. Yeah. I don't know the mic. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you for having me and giving me this space. Um, I really, really hope, um, I hope this makes a difference and it helps people who are going through this, that that's really my hope. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not 
generally someone who likes to share my personal stories. I feel like those are very personal and private, but I, I really feel the need to do this really to help people who are suffering right now. And so that's, that's my hope that, you know, people around the world who feel stuck know that there really is a way out. Yeah. Thank you, Miriam. And to anyone listening, if you would like to write or request to be on this show, on the Francisca show, No More Silence segment, please do reach out to me. My email is franciscak at gmail.com. You can also message me here on Facebook. And if you enjoyed this episode, please do subscribe to the Francisca Show podcast on your podcast app and leave us a review. And this is a once a month, no more silence special that we host on the Francisca Show. So I will post this on the podcast later today. It will be available tomorrow. And I'm still trying to figure out how we're going to go forward with the podcast. We have about eight or nine pre-recorded interviews. But since everyone's online looking for visual activity, I will keep everyone who's been pre-recorded posted on what's happening. In the meantime, stay safe. Stay home. It saves lives. And yeah, thank you so much for listening today. Have a great day. Thank you, Miriam. We're 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 off. One minute. One minute.